Okay, in this video we're going to talk about uh, uh, kinetic theory of gases and we're going to do one of usually a confused derivation uh, which is the expression for pressure due to a gas or pressure on a wall of a container due to a gas. Okay, <clears throat> this is what you can think about. Imagine you have a cubicle, a nice cubicle container which has gas molecules around it and that's what we think. We feel that there are some molecules that are going at a blistering speed and there are some which are going very slow. And so now comes the question, in such a case, how do we evaluate pressure that is coming on this wall of a container? It seems to be a very hopeless situation. However, if we use some assumptions, and so these assumptions, assumptions are required, if we use some assumptions, then we will be able to work out uh, the force or the pressure on the walls of the container. Now, what are going to be these assumptions? Let's state them. Okay, the first assumption that we are going to make is that these molecules are very tiny, extremely tiny molecules. That's not a bad assumption, you can't even see them. Even with micro microscopes, you can't see these atoms, so it's not a bad assumption that they're very tiny. It's a very accurate assumption. Second thing that we are going to assume, which is important, is that these molecules are not going to, uh, atoms or molecules, whatever, are not going to collide with each other. So no collision with each other. Now you might say that's, that's, that's not possible. Well, I know in reality they do collide with each other and they will collide a lot, but our final answer will be unaffected regardless of whether we consider these collisions or not. So let's just keep it simple without considering those collisions. All right. Another assumption that we are going to make is that when these molecules collide with the walls, because they're only going to collide with walls now, this time of contact, I'll call it as delta T, is very small and so I'll almost consider it to be zero. Again, not a bad not a bad assumption. Uh, you take a tennis ball and you bounce it off the wall and you will see it almost for, it, it is, it, within an instant it just bounces back. So the time of contact is extremely small even for macroscopic objects. So clearly when we consider gases, their type of contacts are going to be very small which can be neglected. Another assumption that we will make is that these these molecules, these atoms, when they collide with the walls, they are not going to lose any energy. That's important. And we call that as a, a perfect elastic collision. So, perfect elastic collisions. That's an important assumption. Again, not bad. And yeah. One more important assumption, we are going to forget gravity. So forget about gravity. And now again you will say that, yeah, how can you do that because we have gravity. Well, yeah, gravity does affect, but uh, since these molecules are zooming around with a very high speed, and believe me, they are extremely high when you calculate, you will see some of they, they go at around 1000 meters per second and so. So when they do that, we can completely neglect these gravitational accelerations. And so we, we are going to ignore gravity. And when we ignore gravity, something beautiful happens. If there is no gravity, then these molecules don't have an up or don't have a down, which means that, uh, you know, their uh, probability of moving in any direction is exactly the same. So if you take, talk about the x and y and z axis, then on an average, their velocity along the x, along the y, and along the z has to be exactly the same. It's like, when you toss a coin, if it's, if it's a fair coin, then half the time it's going to be heads and half the time it's going to be tails, provided we do this billions of times. So when you do, when you have billions of molecules, we call as statistical assumptions when you do statistics, that time we can always say that, you know, any direction you consider the velocity is going to be the same. So on an average for any atom, if you take its velocity along the x, its velocity along the y and its velocity along the z, it's going to be exactly the same. And so I would like to write something else over here which we are going to use later, that if you consider any molecule, any atom, 
I just call this velocity as v. So if you consider any atom, it has a velocity vector. It has a velocity v along i direction, y along j direction, and z along k direction. And so the magnitude of that velocity, total velocity, is always going to be vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. Or if I square this one, I can write this as vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared. And since they're all exactly the same, I can just write it as 3v squared. I can write, in general, this velocity v squared is going to be one third of the total velocity. And we are going to use this. I'll call this as equation 1, and we are going to use this equation later. So pay attention to what I've written over there. That equation is basically telling me that this molecule is it's basically telling me about fifth assumption, that this molecule does not have any preferred direction. It can go in any direction. And so if I calculate its velocity along any direction, this is either x or y or z, which I call in general v, is one third square of it is going to be one third of the square of the total velocity. All right, <clears throat> now let's consider a collision and let's consider an average atom. Here's one average atom doing its own thing. What I want to show you in this slide is uh, if I'm concentrating on a wall which is along the x direction, so that is uh, this wall, so I'm only going to be talking about collisions that happen on that wall. That time, only the momentum or the velocity along the x direction gets changed. That is the component of the velocity along the x direction. What you can see is that when I'm considering the molecules or the atoms collision with the wall along the x direction, I only have to worry about its velocity reversal in the x direction. Its y direction velocity or its y z direction velocity is not going to change. And that makes our lives very easy. So all I have to do is just worry about the x direction and then generalize the both thing. So we're going to use all this together and try and derive the expression for pressure. All right. Okay. On to the next slide. So let's start our derivation over here. So I'm going to consider an, 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 average, velo an, an average atom which has some random velocity in this direction. But since I'm going to consider only this wall, it's going to go and it's going to bang into that wall. And when it bangs into that wall, there's a change in momentum of that particular atom. And the change in momentum of that atom, I call it a change in momentum of that atom, is going to be 2 times mv of x, because I only care about the x direction. And Therefore, the total momentum that is delivered to the wall must also be the same. So the momentum delivered to the wall is exactly the same. And they are opposite in direction, of course, but I'm only worrying about the magnitude. So the momentum delivered to the wall is the same as the momentum delivered to the atom. Okay, but if I want to calculate what the force is, then that is the rate of change of momentum. That's delta P delivered to the wall divide by the time of contact and you will immediately say hey we had an assumption that this time of contact is extremely small it's almost zero then how are we going to evaluate the force well you have to remember that this object this this atom is going to collide with the wall goes this way and goes like so and then comes back so between two successive collisions there is a lot of time there it's so it is this time is a time between successive collisions. Successive collisions. And so when we do that, what I'm getting now is not the force per, per contact, it's the average force. I'm getting the average force that is delivered by our atom or to the wall. So I repeat, it's not the force that the ball, that the, that the molecule or the atom delivers when it hits. No. That time it delivers a huge force, but I'm averaging it out. I'm also considering the time when it's not hitting that wall. All right, so how much is that time? Well, if I say that this cube has a length L over here, then the distance traveled 
by that atom is two times L for two successive collisions, right? And its speed along the x direction is Vx. And so I can say the time of contact, which is delta t, is going to be this distance traveled divided by the speed is going to be 2L divided by Vx. So I can substitute that all in over here. I will get delta P that is 2MVx divided by delta T that is 2L divided by Vx which I can write as 2MVx squared divided by 2L and these two can be cancelled. So the average force which I'm going to get now, this is due to one molecule, one atom, whatever you want to call it, is going to be MVx squared divided by L. But there are so many atoms, there are N atoms in this container. And so the average force by all of them together, so average force due to all, so all N atoms, is going to be M by L Vx1 squared, M by L Vx2 squared, and so on, M by L Vx oh, N squared. And now I can just take that M by L out, and so I have Vx1 squared, this is the velocity of the first atom, Vx2 squared, velocity of the second one, Vx n squared, velocity of the nth one. There's no reason why all the atoms should have the same velocity. Of course they don't have the same velocity. I even showed you in that slide. So I have to consider the fact that all the atoms are having different velocities. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide this by n and I'm going to multiply this by n. You will see shortly why. So this is the average force by all the atoms together now. Is going to be so this is the average by all the n atoms together is going to be m into n into l and this number over here which are um, this one over here this one I'm going to give a name to it I'm just going to call this as uh, v r m s squared don't worry about what that is. I will spend some time trying to explain what that is. But for now, I just call it as V R M S. And yeah, I have to give a subscript X there because it's only along the X direction. X squared. Okay. So far, so good. And from now on, it's, it's going to be just uh, converting that force into pressure. Okay, so let me rewrite what we had in my last slide. So I have force, that is the average force by all the n molecules, or atoms, is going to be m to n to v RMS, which I'm going to tell you what that is a little later, subscript x, because we're only considering the x direction, divided by L. And since now I'm worried about the pressure, pressure is force over area, so all I have to do is divide this by this area of this wall, and we know that the area of that wall is L squared. So all I have to do is divide this by the area. And so I will get a cube in the denominator. So RMS squared. It's an X over here. Divided by L cube in the denominator. <laughs> okay. Um, what do we do next? All right, now let's let's remember that equation one which I told you. I wrote that equation one was that v along any direction you want x, y, or z, whatever you want to call that, is one third of the total velocity. Remember that. I hope you remember that. And I'm going to use the same thing. So this is RMS value along the x direction, which will be one third of the total RMS value. And so I'm going to substitute that over here. So I get now M, N, I get a 3, L cube over here, 
and this now becomes the total RMS speed. I can now remove that subscript because no longer am I considering only x direction, I'm considering all the directions together. Okay. Now, what is this L cube? L cube is nothing but the volume. And so I can take that L cube there, and we have our final expression. P into V, that's the volume. Don't confuse that with the velocity. This is volume. I will make it this way. Okay. Is equal to M into capital N into V RMS squared oh, divided by 3. And that is the famous equation of kinetic theory of gases. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's look at some things. Okay, the first thing is I owe you the explanation of what that what that RMS squared group is. I'm going to remind you what we did over here. Look at what we have done. If I if I use a yellow for this, I'll explain it over here itself. If you consider this, you can see that V R M S X is the square root of V X one square plus V X two square V X n square divided by n, right? Because it's a square over here, and so V R M S X is the square root. Now I'll tell you why it's called as R, because this is a square root, so there comes an R. And square root of what? Is the square root of the mean. See, we are adding things up and we are dividing by the total number that is taking mean. That's the reason I divided by n and I multiplied by n here. Smart. That's the mean. That comes m over here. And what am I taking mean of? I am taking mean of these squares of the velocities. Yeah? Look at them. And so it is square. And that's what this RMS stands for. It's called as the root of the mean of the squares of all the velocities. And there's a subscript x over here just to remind you that we are only considering the x direction. And so now, if you go for the final equation, you see I have I have considered in all directions. So the root mean square is, is the so root of mean of square of all the velocities of all the molecules. You can take that total velocity. It's no longer the x direction. Okay. This equation is extremely important because it is one of the very few equations you will see in physics where you have some macroscopic quantities, pressure, volume are macroscopic in nature, and they are connected with the microscopic quantities. You see, mass of a gas is a microscopic quantity. Velocity of a gas, uh, that's, that's a microscopic quantity. So we can have a connection between masses and velocity, which are microscopic in nature, and they can be connected to macroscopic quantities like pressure and volume. That is the significance of this equation.